Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're finishing our colour series, for now at least, with purple, pink and brown. But before we get going, a little bit of preliminary material. First, we really want to say another big thank you to our newest Patreon supporters, Talk the Talk podcast. And if you haven't already started listening to the Talk the Talk podcast, you should. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a radio show in, in the city of Perth in Australia with linguist Daniel Midgley, accompanied by Kylie Sturgis and Ben Ainsley on and off. And they talk about linguistic issues, linguistic stuff in the news. It's really very, very good. And you should definitely check it out. Yeah, absolutely one of our top favorites. And then also Shiggity Shank, which is the username that the person used on Patreon. So thank you to Shiggity Shank for your support. And your great name. <laughs> and anyone who would like to join those two people in becoming new Patreons, new patrons, New patrons. Patreon <laughs> patrons, I guess. Uh, please head over to patreon.com slash the endless knot or patreon.ca slash the endless knot. Either one will get us. And we really appreciate everything that people have been able to give us. Next, continuing with the theme of linguistics podcasts. We were recently interviewed by another linguistics podcast called Let's Talk Talk, hosted by Seth Wilson. We talked about etymology, about Latin, about Old English. I may have ranted a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> about, yeah, about we talked about uh, language conventions and... Where some of the zombie rules in English yeah. come from, things like that. We had a really good time talking to Seth. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, so we would encourage you to check that out. So that's Let's Talk Talk. We'll put a link in the show notes, of course to the episode that we recorded with him. And while you're there, have a listen to his other great episodes. They're all a lot of fun, and he explains some very important fundamental linguistics concepts. Mm -hmm. And then finally, before we turn to cocktails, a little bit of follow-up from our previous episode. Oh, actually, I guess it's two episodes ago, a podcast about Create, um, where we talked about mealtime terms, in particular about breakfast and dinner, the terms. A couple of people replied to us on Twitter and pointed out the highly complex issue of mealtime terminology, in particular with respect to lunch, tea, dinner, and supper. Which of those you eat and at what time in the day? This is an issue that's particularly key in the UK. Yeah. And there is an interesting article that uh, discusses what terminology you use, what that says about where you're from and so forth. Okay, so I'll put that link in the show notes as well. Yes. And we might come to that at some point to do a fuller discussion on mealtime terms. We're used to it being quite simple here. Hmm. In Canada, you have breakfast, you have lunch, and you either have dinner or supper. They're pretty much interchangeable. Yeah. There may be patterns of usage, but mm -hmm. it's the same meal. Yeah. It's six or seven o'clock in the evening, and it's the big meal of the day. Yeah. And... So thank you to MJ Mann, who's second Achilles on Twitter, and Mary Wombat, uh, Little Mavis on Twitter, th for bringing those issues to our attention and chatting about that a little bit. All right, so now turning to our drinks. We're talking about purple, so we're going to have a, a purple drink. A purple drink. And the most classic purple drink is an aviation. So I have put a link to that in the show notes. But the basic aviation recipe is gin and maraschino liqueur, a little bit, and lemon juice and creme de violette, which, of course, is what gives it the purple, purple color. color. Yeah. It's a nice light, sort of pale purple lilac, maybe one might call it. Mm -hmm. So have a try of that. It's actually a drink I have fairly often and quite like it. And I do quite like it. Yes, mm -hmm. it is very nice. It's very perfumey. The creme yes. de violette, of course, is yeah. a very flowery, perfumey thing. And the maraschino liqueur is cherry flavored sort of but it's a it's not that sort of sweet cherry no, flavored no, yeah. anyway so yeah uh you can try that if you want creme de violette has become a little easier to get in recent years but it's still a little bit of a specialty liqueur but it is a, a nice purple color probably artificial at this point but still pretty mm -hmm. all right so with all of those things out of the way let us turn to our main topic now as regular listeners will know we've been intermittently talking about colors 
and every time we talk about colors, almost, I mention, oh, but that has to do with purple. And we're not talking about purple yet, but we're getting to purple. <laughs> so it's, it's all been building up to this moment. <laughs> At least for me. So I have a lot to say about purple. So we'll talk about purple first, then we'll talk about pink and brown. And that will bring us to the end pretty much of the basic color terms in English. We've covered pretty much everything. The only one we haven't really done is gray, but I don't think either of us have very much to say about gray. Not a huge amount, no. No. Now we may yet return to this topic. Some people um, have brought up some of the more modern associations and the fascinating history of dyes in the 19th century, artificial dyes. And there are other things to be said. So we yes. may come back so to there, them. There could be. But for the moment, in terms of sort of talking about the basic origins and, and ancient and medieval associations of these colors, I think this is the last one. So let's turn to purple. Both Greek and Latin have a number of words for purple, but almost all of them refer to the thing that purple is made from. The Greek words for purple that are probably most well known or most influential are phoenikeos, which just means Phoenician, yeah, and porphyra, which is the name of a shellfish. And by the way, we don't know where that word comes from. Um, right. It's suspected to be Semitic in origin. Mm -hmm. So probably from Phoenician. Phoenician. And then we also have Tyrinos, which is Tyrian, mm -hmm. to do with the city of Tyre. Then there's a word Calche, which means a limpet. So another shellfish word. And so you have Calcion. I don't know that. I only know it from looking up in the dictionary. I've never seen that one. And the only other one that is not related to these shellfish and Phoenician words is Eon, which is violet. And it's the name for the violet, the flower. So you have violet colored. Right. So that's a completely separate root. Now, all of those words that have to do with the shellfish are, of course, what they are because of where the color purple comes from in the ancient world. So the dye, when used in clothing, came almost exclusively. There were a few other sources of it, but basically the good purple color came out exclusively from a small shellfish that was found in the Mediterranean waters off the coast of Phoenicia that was collected by skilled divers and processed in a secret technique that we don't know exactly the details of. It involved boiling them and doing complicated things to them to produce a very, very expensive dye that was then known by the name of the region that it produced it and the shellfish that it came from. So you get Phoenikios and Tierrinos, referring to Phoenicia and Tyre, because of course they were the exclusive sources of this color. So the term became completely associated with the city of Tyre and the uh, region of Phoenicia. And that association with the shellfish continues into Latin. So if you go into Latin, you get pretty much just transliterations of the Greek. You get Phoenikeus again. You get Purpureus which is a Latinification of Porphyria. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. You get Osterinus, which is another reference to the shellfish, just a different word for the shellfish. Mm -hmm. And Murex, which is the name for the shellfish, another name for it, that is used, therefore, in combination as a, so, you know, colored with Murex. Right. So it's not used as an adjective exactly, but right. it's used as a noun in phrases to make things uh, purple colored. And again, we don't know where that word murex comes from for sure, mm -hmm. but one suggestion is that it might be related to moose, mouse. Mm. Not moose, no. as in large <laughs> ungulate. No, no. Latin, the Latin word moose. <laughs> right, or that the, makes more sense. Or the Greek word moose. Oh, okay. Because there's a Greek, there's a Greek word muax, which means sea mussel. Oh, okay. And so the idea is so everything apparently looks like mice to uh, the ancient world. Um, <laughs> your muscles do, your, your sea muscles your, do. <laughs> your sea muscles, yeah. So both those words in English, muscle right. and muscle, are essentially the same word. They both come from oh, okay. the word for mouse. I didn't realize that. Yep. And so might this word murex. Okay. Because presumably it also looks like a mouse. <laughs> We saw mice everywhere. <laughs> Proto-Indo-Europeans thought everything was shiny. shiny yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Greeks and Romans thought everything was a mouse. Yeah. So those are your colors. Now there's one other Latin word that gets used sometimes, blateus, to mean purple. And frankly, I don't know what that means or where it's from. Okay. I mean, it is used sometimes. It's not completely uncommon, right. but it's certainly not the most common. So those are your words. 
So obviously they all very strongly connect to the origin of the dye. And what that does mean is that the associations of the color purple in the ancient world are impossible to disassociate in most cases from the dye, which means it's not a word that has associations on some sort of chromatic level. It is always connected to this highly expensive, very difficult to get and foreign. Mm. So for both the Greeks and the Romans, it's a foreign mm -hmm. produced substance, uh, substance, which means all of the sort of symbolic resonances and cultural resonances are going to be bound up with those aspects of the thing that produces it. So nothing that is colored purple and called purple is merely purple in color. Right. Now, the other important thing to get to before I get to those symbolic resonances, which are many, is that the color, the actual color, the wavelengths conveyed by these words is quite variable. Now, we've run into this before. We've discussed how red or blue and green mm -hmm. and yellow, the dividing lines mm -hmm. between those colors have been quite complicated. And we discussed even how white and black don't necessarily always mean what we think they mean, you know? Right. This is really true with purple because from the range of things that are called purple and from some bits of discussion by the technical authors, like authors who talk about color from a technical terminology point of view or are trying to explain about art mm -hmm. or trying to be scientific about color, it's quite clear that the depending on how the dye was treated, you could produce a dye that would color clothes and wool anything from what we would call probably a royal blue mm -hmm. to scarlet. That's quite interesting, given that the modern scientific definition of what purple is, mm -hmm. is that it doesn't describe a wavelength of color, of colored light, but is in fact a mixture of red and blue. Pigments? Pigments. If you're talking about what we would sort of casually think of as purple light, mm -hmm. what you actually mean is violet. That right. scientifically, in terms of what is scientifically considered a wavelength of light, is, is violet. Okay, so there is no, there is no technically, there technically is no purple. purple light. It's a mixture of either pigment or red and blue light. Right, right. Okay, so yes. So maybe this isn't surprising then. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, you know, what physical objects could be described as purple, apart from clothing, right. can be things that to us could never be purple, right. right? So one of the things you end up with is this mismatch when you try to translate it as purple, and it just sounds really odd. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when we think purple, we think sort of Welsh's grapes colored purple. Right. So if you describe, say, fingers as purple or blood as purple, mm. um, no. <laughs> It's not, not so, trans, you know, on a very basic level, translators have to face this problem. So that's the first thing to realize is that the color could be quite variable and that there was no sort of consistency expected by somebody if they said the word purple, because it meant dyed with this particular dye, which could be anything. Now, what was true of all of those chromatic ranges is they were rich and deep colors. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have what we might call like lilac or, you know, light blue. Right. They would always be rich and deep. So the color connotation is more about that sort of richness, which was very difficult to achieve with fabric dyes at the time, with natural dyes. So, you know, that's going to make it stand out. And that seems to have been more important. Often when people use the word purple to describe something, they're calling attention to sort of a lustrousness, a depth of color, a richness of the color, rather than exactly where it falls on your color wheel. Right. So that's where it comes from. That's what it describes. Now, what was its significance? Well, the obvious thing is, first of all, it's really expensive and not many people can use it. So from the very beginning in Greek and Roman thought, it is associated strongly with royalty and with the divinities. And it never loses those associations, at least in the ancient world. It can have other associations as well, but it never loses them. Second, because it can cover colors well into the red spectrum in our mind, it is often connected with blood because blood has not only the color spectrum, but has that lustrousness. The richness is a deep, meaningful color. And so blood is not unusually purple, but it can also be uh, connected to eroticism. So that gets, brings us all the way back to red when I was talking about that strong erotic connotation of red. Right. So purple can also be erotic. It is also beautiful. So purple is a beautiful color. 
And it is a beautiful color, partly because it's beautiful, mm. partly because it's rich and mm-hmm. divine. Mm-hmm. So you, or you call something purple, purpureos or uh, fornikeos or whatever, because it's beautiful or to emphasize its beauty. Right. So that's important. So those are the sort of basic connotations. The most famous Greek context here probably is in the Agamemnon by Aeschylus, which is a play about Agamemnon returning home from the Trojan War and being welcomed home by his wife, Clytemnestra, who's about to kill him. And as he arrives in his chariot, she says, don't just walk on the ground. You're a conquering hero. You are so important. And so they spread purple cloths on the ground. And then he spends like 200 lines saying, I can't walk on purple garments. That's wasteful. That's something an Eastern king, a barbarian king would do. I'm not a barbarian king. I'm a mere man. I can't walk on it. And she says, oh, no, of course you can. You're so wonderful. If you can't, who can? Your feet should not touch the ground. You're such an important person and persuades him to do so. And so he walks on these purple cloths into the palace. And then the next thing we hear from him is him being murdered in his bath by Clytemnestra, who has wrapped him in a net, Hmm. caught him in a net and stabbed him Hmm. and releasing his blood into the bath. Right. Right. So there's obviously a very obvious thematic correspondence between these purple robes and the blood of his murder. In particular, if we remember, they're not necessarily purple. They're red. Right. It's a red carpet. Right. (laughs) And I mean, it has that sort of connotation. Only a very special person is going to walk on a red carpet. One of the ways she's sort of trying to justify her murder is by making him commit a sort of impiety. It's not really a justification for it. So there's this, you can see there that sort of really important connotation of their purple cloths and it's important because they're expensive and and they're divine and royal and and there's a moral quality to them. Right. But they're also visually reminiscent of blood and therefore tie in very closely to the repeated th- themes of blood and blood on people's hands and things in that play cycle. And then you have people wearing purple cloaks and weaving, Helen weaves purple fabric in the Iliad when she's waiting in, during the siege. She's sitting and weaving her own story. We talked about that during mm. the clue uh, discussion, but it's a purple cloth that okay. she's weaving mm-hmm. because of course she's royal and semi-divine. So mm-hmm. of course she's weaving purple cloth, not some boring white cloth. All right. Now, for the Romans, then, this gets even more complicated because, of course, the Romans start out as a monarchy and they have kings. And then they throw the kings over and they get rid of them. And then ever since the kings are gone, it's very wrong to think of yourself as a king. The Romans hate kings. So, of course, they hate things that are signifiers of kingship. So they ought to hate purple because purple is purple and gold together in particular. But purple is a clear marker of kingship. Right. And so they do. And it's also Eastern. It's Phoenician. It's barbarian. And the Romans always are suspicious of things from the decadent East. Both the Greeks and anyone in Persia and anyone in the Near East, they're decadent. They're soft. They're luxurious. They're going to weaken Roman virility with their decadence. Right. Okay, so purple is also real problematic for that. But the Romans also use purple. They use purple to mark the toga of a consul. They use purple to mark the toga of a young boy. They use purple to mark out, in other words, magisterial positions. So purple gets co-opted into their political structure. Hmm. Instead of being kingly, it is used to mark part of their republican structure. So purple is also very revered because the purple stripe on a toga or on a tunic marks a particular kind of class and marks up people who have the highest Republican status. When a general is awarded a triumph and gets to ride through the city in procession after a great victory in some battle, he wears a toga picta, which is an entirely purple dyed toga with gold embroidery on it. And his face is colored with red. Hmm. So he's made into a god briefly right. as an imperator, as a triumphator, somebody who celebrated a triumph. So they use purple as this marker. And in fact, it becomes strictly controlled. There's laws passed about who's allowed to wear purple, who's allowed to wear purple dyed things, what width of a you know stripe you're allowed to wear in different classes and things like that. So it becomes this really fraught signifier 
Uh, and this is all in the Republican period. Under the Empire, it becomes more simple because you right. have essentially have a king. Essentially king. Right. <laughs> so maybe not immediately. Augustus doesn't go on around wearing full purple togas. But later on, once you the Empire is established and emperors are emperors and nobody's worried about it, it, lose, it becomes just a, a luxurious thing, mostly. But in the Republic, and, and especially towards the end of the Republic, it's got this really kind of rich signification that can be employed in different ways. And it continues to have this connotation of luxuriousness and eroticism as well, because it's beautiful. Mm. I have to pause to drink a little more purple drink <laughs> so I can talk a bit more. And what ends up happening then is you get, in particular, poets in the Augustan period and pre-Augustan period really kind of using purple in this way to, to mark things out as divinities in ways that can seem really strange if you don't understand all of that background to it. So one quite famous, as always, I use the word famous in a very restricted sense, <laughs> uh, use of this is in a Horace Ode, Ode 3-3, three, three, being quite. And in this, it's really the whole poem is about the steadfastness of Augustus and how he stands up to the trials and tribulations of his position and masters the world. And he talks about various gods, Jupiter and Bacchus. And he talks about Pollux and Hercules in particular as being demigods who had eventually became gods. And then he says, they reached the fiery citadels where Augustus shall recline one day drinking nectar to stain his rosy lips. Now that's a translation from Poetry in Translation, but it's not actually rosy in the Latin. In the Latin it's here, Augustus recumbens purpureo bibet ore nectar. So he will drink nectar with his purple lips. Right. And obviously, if you think of them as being grape colored purple, it's ridiculous. So that's why it's never translated or very rarely translated as purple lips, because that just sounds ludicrous. It sounds clown like. So why would they be purple? Well, obviously here he's imagining Augustus deified. And so his lips are purple because that's appropriate. That's the color red mm. if you're a divinity. Right. So there's two other examples of this that I, of the complexity of purple in Rome that I want to use, and then I will mm. stop. <laughs> you can tell me anything more you want to say about purple and move on to the other colors. One of them is in the Aeneid. So again, Augustan period. This is by Virgil during Augustus's lifetime, in which we have Aeneas, the exile from Troy, who's on his way to found a new city and become the proto-Roman, firm, pious, devoted to duty above all else. And he ends up briefly in Carthage. And Carthage is, of course, a Phoenician city, it's a Phoenician colony. And there he gets sidetracked from his duty by Dido, queen of the Carthaginians. And he falls in love with her, or probably does, and she falls in love with him. And he dallies there and sort of forgets his primary purpose for a while. And when Jupiter's attention is drawn to this, he sends his messenger god Mercury to tell Aeneas, like, what are you doing? You're supposed to go to Italy. You have a job to do. What are you doing here, spending your time with these Carthaginians? And when Mercury arrives to tell this to Aeneas, he finds him overseeing the building of Carthage. So mm. building a city, but not the right city. A Phoenician city, a Carthaginian city. Remember, Carthage will become the great opponent, enemy, right. the great enemy of Rome, exactly. And he's standing there wearing, we're told, a purple cloak embroidered with gold made for him by the hand of Dido herself. And then he's also got a sword in a sheath that's studded with precious stones. And Mercury immediately says to him, you xorious man, what are you doing standing here watching another city be built? And then he delivers Jupiter's mm. orders that he has to leave. And immediately Aeneas thinks, oh my goodness, I've done the wrong thing. And he leaves and Dido kills herself. But it's really key that he's wearing a purple cloak. And I won't go into all the details of it because as I said to you earlier, I'm writing an article on that. And it's very, <laughs> very detailed because other people wear purple cloaks, including Jason in the Argonautica in Greek epic. And there's a lot of associations of purple. But one of the sort of obvious things is he's wearing a cloak dyed with Phoenician purple and embroidered with gold that is not right. It's not Roman purple. Right. It's not proper senatorial purple or consular purple. It's luxurious, eastern, decadent, royal purple. He's acting like a king and he's acting like a Phoenician, somebody who's Punic, and he's decadent and eastern and luxurious. And all of those things are wrapped up in this purple cloak. Right. So it's, you know, it's a highly significant purple cloak. It's not just a that it's pretty or something. Mm. And it's erotic because purple is erotic. And it was made for him by Dido herself. 
Now, a good Roman woman does make her husband's clothes. One of the sort of virtues of a Roman woman traditionally was that she spun and wove the clothing for the household. That was an important part of her economic participation in the household, but also it was seen as virtuous and chaste because you do that sitting at home alone or with your maids right. in a purely female capacity. It keeps you segregated from the males. It's a, an important a marker of domesticity and virtue and chastity for a Roman woman. So Dido, who thinks she's married to Aeneas, has made him his cloak, like a good Roman woman. But she's done it with gold and purple. And that's not a good Roman woman at all. A good Roman woman would be making a toga, a nice white toga. So she's done it, but she's done it wrong. Because she's not a good Roman woman. She's a Cleopatra in the making. Right. You know, she's an Eastern queen taking a Roman man from his duty, just like Cleopatra with Antony. And so all of that is in just, it's just a line and a half in Virgil. But to a Roman audience, the significance of the purple and the gold together would be so strong that it would be completely unmistakable mm. that this was there. And that brings me to my last point, which should be fairly short, which is all of that uh, idea of, uh, you know, Roman women being virtuous and chaste when they spin wool and make clothing. The obvious example of that is Lucretia, who is the woman who is raped and then calls on Brutus to avenge her to drive out the kings from Rome. So she's the instrument of driving out the last kings and establishing the Republic. She's famed for when all the other wives of the Roman women, men were partying and drinking with men, she was sitting alone with her maids spinning in the dark by lamplight, spinning wool, proving how virtuous and chaste she was. So Lucretia becomes this emblem. Lucretia spinning as an emblem of womanly chastity and wifely chastity. And she, of course, it's never said, but would have been spinning white wool. There's a poem by Propertius, who's a love poet in, in the Augustan period as well, in which he comes home from a drunken night of revelry. Well, not home, but he goes to visit his beloved Cynthia. And he comes in to find her asleep. And he tries to sort of give her a gift of apples he's brought with her. But she wakes up. And she yells at him and she says, how could you come home so late? I was waiting up all alone by the lamplight spinning. I was spinning wool to keep myself awake, waiting for you, solitary. And you were probably out with other women, but I was here so chaste and alone. And she makes herself out to be a Lucretia, right? The mm. faithful Roman woman. But she says she was spinning purple wool. And just with that one line that she was spinning purple wool, it sort of parodies the entire thing. Because she's not a faithful Roman woman. She's a courtesan or prostitute that's mm. who she is and it's very clear and, and she's not faithful in fact all the other poems are about how unfaithful she is and she's trying to pretend she's lucretia but she's like dido getting it wrong because right. she's spinning purple wool not white wool so in both of those cases you can see how the significance of the color it, it's a, it's a small detail but it's enough to completely shift the significance of this really important cultural element which is this idea of women making clothes into something completely different and so purple, it's this highly charged color, whether it's called purpureus or murica or ostrinus, it doesn't matter which of the terms is used. In Latin, though, it's always one of those sort of Phoenician or shellfish connected words that has that kind of resonance. Anything that's ever called purple like that means so much more than its color. So that's reasonably extended, but not completely full <laughs> version of my story of purple. Uh, I could talk more about it, but won't, because I'm sure I've already pushed the patience of <laughs> most listeners. But so suffice it to say that purple was an important color in the ancient world. I haven't touched on every element of it by any means, but I think enough to show you that it, it, you know, it had a lot of significance in a lot of multiple overlapping ways. Right. So Over to you. <laughs> Well, that's the the cultural heritage that the Middle Ages inherited mm -hmm. um, from the ancient world, these associations of purple. And to a large extent, those associations continue. I should point out, perhaps, the obvious that the modern word purple comes from purpurus. Right. The R becomes an L sound through a process of dissimilation rather than having two R's next to each other like that. Pur, pur. Right. Okay. Pur, pur becomes purple. Right. But as I say, these, th those associations of royalty mm -hmm. continue. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the royal color yep. in, in the Middle Ages and also uh, the color of high-ranking clergy. Right. So there you have that almost overlapping of divinity and, yeah. and royalty. Yeah. Yeah. But due to the sort of economic collapse of the, the Roman Empire, uh, Empire yeah. the dye becomes rarer and rarer mm -hmm. and basically becomes impossible to get a hold of after the fall of Constantinople. 
Right. The sack of Constantinople in 1204. After that, they lose access to purple. I also saw one reference to the the shellfish itself becoming rare or nearly. Yeah, nearly I think extinct. it was overfished so to a large also extent. Overfished yeah. as well. So there are numerous causes why the the dye just became unavailable to mm -hmm. medieval Europe. Right. And so it also kind of along with that, or or maybe in in a sense related to that, decided that it was too luxurious. So, for instance, Pope Paul II in 1464 ordered that cardinals change from wearing purple to wearing a cloth dyed with kermes, which is a type of insect, which is more of a scarlet mm -hmm. color, I guess. And I think more consistently a scarlet, more, yeah, yeah. Yeah, more consistently a scarlet color. Leading to our association of cardinal with red. With red, which yeah. Is like the bird and the flower mm -hmm. and things, yeah. And they would also overlay the Kermes dye with indigo, which is a kind of blue right. dye, to make a sort of purple, but it's not the, the Tyrian purple. Right, right. So that, I mean, that's the, the, the basic connotations through the, the Middle right. Ages and right. into the Renaissance. So royalty and clergy. Royalty and, and clergy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, they, of course, also had other words for what we would loosely categorize as purple. Mm -hmm. Violet, obviously, is is the key one. And right. As I mentioned, that is sort of the spectrum of visible light. We now consider violet, really, mm -hmm. if you think of your Roy G. Biv, right? right. It's, it's violet, not purple. Right. Well, the word violet uh, obviously refers to the flower, comes from the flower mm -hmm. first, mm -hmm. that word, uh, which comes from Latin viola, which is related to that Greek word that you mentioned, eon. Oh, yeah. Interesting. And that also gives us, uh, through learned coinage, uh, the word iodine, 18th century, uh, late 18th century. It was first, I think, in French, a uh, form of that word suggested for that chemical that was uh, produced. Right. And that's the weird thing there is that iodine looks purple, but when you use it, it dries yellow. Right. Which is a strangeness. And the first to really coin the word in English is Sir Humphrey Davy. Oh, who's okay. come up in uh, a number of our videos and podcasts before. Mm -hmm. So you will recognize the name perhaps. Of course, the other color that has to be mentioned in this context is indigo. Yeah. And we may have briefly touched on it before in our blue episode. Yeah, I think we talked about it, yeah. But basically indigo means from India, so mm -hmm. dye from India, basically. But it was made a basic color term by uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Right. He wanted to have seven basic colors. When he divided the when he spectrum divided of light. The spectrum into... of light. Right. And he, he says, of course, it's a continuous spectrum. There's mm -hmm. no, you know, hard dividing lines. But he, in, in terms of his theory of color, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to have seven because surprisingly, Newton was, you know, he believed in numerology and various mystical things. Yeah. And so he wanted to have the, you know, the number seven. He felt was, that it was an important was number, and important so therefore number. there must be seven. Yeah. Seven colors, just like there are seven basic tones in a scale. Mm -hmm. And so he invented essentially indigo as a, as a basic color term. And is it blue? Well, it's not blue. It's not violet, according to him. It's a different color. It's right. maybe somewhere between blue and violet. But it's nowhere near as different from either of those as yeah. red is from yeah. from orange. Another common modern English word in the purple mm -hmm. range is, of course, mauve. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm not going to mention every... There's a bunch of There's them There's a that... lot of words. I'm going to mention the interesting ones. Well, and a lot of them are just named after the thing. The thing, yeah. So mauve uh, is named after a thing. Uh, it comes from malva, which means mallow, the mallow plant. Oh, okay. Which has a purple flower. Right. So it's named after a purple flower, essentially. Interestingly, this mallow plant, malva, gives us another kind of color-related word based on the green of its leaves. It gives us the word malachite. Oh, From okay. Greek. Right. From the Greek. So purple and green. Right. And why exactly that particular shade of green was uh, thought to Nip. look like malachite, I don't know. But right. uh, anyways. Another purple word that comes from a thing is amethyst. The, right. Like the rock. It comes from Greek, literally meaning not drunk. Yes, uh, I know this one. <laughs> is it Metheus? Mm -hmm. I think is the actual Greek. And that word is cognate. That second element, the drunk mm -hmm. part, is cognate with mead, the drink. Oh, <laughs> which gets you drunk. So that makes sense. Yeah. It's a Proto-Indo-European root that, that means honey right. and, and by extension wine. Right. And the reason that amethyst is called that is that there was a belief that it prevented intoxication. So right. this was something that I think they did in ancient Greece. They would wear amethyst rings in the belief that it would prevent some of the... Batter? batter? Um... <laughs> 
unfortunate effects of, of being overindulgent with alcohol. You mean like not remembering how to do your comparatives <laughs> with irregular words? Yes. <clears throat> so I think I'm going to now start wearing amethyst. I have some amethyst jewelry if you'd like. Oh, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> and another purple-ish word, I suppose, is puce. Is it a purple? Is it a brown? I'm not sure. It's a brownish purple or a purplish brown. Well, either way, it fits in today. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're talking about purple and brown. Um, but it comes from pulax, of course, uh, which means flea. Oh, of course. I mean... <laughs> of course. Well, for those of you who know <laughs> French, I guess, yeah. we'd have that. But the, why the would be word. colored? Why is there a color word that comes from the word flea? Well, I guess that particular shade of the, the insect was that color. Fleas are so small, they don't look like anything. <laughs> They just look like little black dots. I guess if you spend all your time picking fleas off yourself, you, you become very aware of their color. I don't know. Seems suspicious to me. <laughs> Maybe when you smear them. <laughs> oh, good. The color <laughs> of blood went in, a, went in a flea. Perfect. Yes. Well, there is that line in a John Donne poem where she purples her nail by squishing the flea. It's the oh, poem. That's true. Flea. That's true. So maybe that's it. <laughs> it doesn't use the word puce, though. But that that's an old Proto-Indo-European root, plu. Okay. That's where that comes from. And one more, I suppose, sort of modern expression that comes from purple words is the expression purple prose or purple passage or purple yep. patch. That comes just from the, the idea of ornateness. So that... Decorative. That, that decorative, purple is decorative. That right. purple is decorative. And rich and, and overly. Rich, yeah. Luxurious. Whatever. So the next time you come across some purple prose, now you'll have the complete history reaching all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome <laughs> as to why, why we say that. So that is everything I have to say about purple. Shall we move on to pink? Sure. And I will dispense with my discussion of pink very quickly. There's no word for pink in the ancient world. There is a word for rosy. They're connected in Greek. There's rodoies, which is of roses, rosy, and roseus in Latin. Rosie. And as we were discussing a little earlier, actually, off air, um, that doesn't necessarily mean pink because roses can be many colors. And I, in fact, think of roses as being red in their most basic color. But I suppose it depends what kind of wild rose you're talking about. Anyway, rosy fingered dawn is the probably most famous use of rosy there. I think probably the term is used mostly where they want the connotations of roses in describing something that's reddish. Right. So they want to compare something reddish to flowers, and in particular, a flower that's strongly associated with beauty and love. So rosy rather than words for red that are more strongly associated with fire or blood. You know, there's yeah. going to be times when you want to describe like a girl or something else in terms that don't bring to mind immediate death. And, <laughs> and fire so rosy becomes the word for it and that's as close as we get to pink that's all i have to say okay. uh, and that's the entirety of the connotations of it in my mind too right well that word rose or rosa mm. in, in latin comes from obviously as a color word in english it comes from the flower mm -hmm. as well as as is used that way in latin and ultimately from the greek rhodon which gives us also rhododendron, mm -hmm. the flower. Right. So if you Flowery. confuse your <laughs> roses with your rhododendrons... You're etymologically you're, appropriate. You're, yes. But the, the main word for pink, obviously, in English is pink. And it's a bit of a mystery word. We know it comes from the flower. So the pinks are a type of flower. And not a particularly well-known flower, not I would say, now. Not a particularly well-known so, yeah. flower now. But so, again, another flower word. Mm -hmm. And the word pink started to be used as a color term in 17... As early, there's a, a citation as early as 1733. So okay. actually quite late. Mm -hmm. Now, the etymology of the flower pink mm -hmm. is unknown. Mm -hmm. There are some possible suggestions. It might be related to the express, like what we have as pinking shears, the pink as in pinking shears. Which are a type of scissors that have a zigzaggy edge. Zigzaggy so edge. you end up yeah. with a, a I'm, I'm drawing pictures with my fingers. This isn't <laughs> working. Um, it's like a triangle yeah. shaped cut. Yeah. yeah. Ragged edge. Yeah. Because of the sort of perforated shape of the petals on okay. pinks. So like they've been pinked. They, they've been pinked. So that's one possibility. But where does the word pink for pinking shares come from? I think it comes from low German Dutch, and then we don't know okay. beyond that. Right. I mean, it means perforated, mm -hmm. basically. The other possibility, again, from Dutch, is uh, from a Dutch word pink that means small. Think pinky finger. Oh, right. I guess it had never occurred to me to wonder why we call it a pinky. Pinky finger, yeah. 
<laughs> so it's a Dutch word that means small. And there was an, an, an expression in Dutch, pink oogen. I may not be pronouncing that anywhere near right, <laughs> which means half closed eyes. Okay. Pink eyes, literally, but right. it's, it's used to mean half closed eyes, referring again to the appearance of the flower. Oh, okay. They look like half closed eyes. Maybe I'll find a link to pink flowers. Pink flowers. Those, the, yeah. the flower pink, if I can figure that out. Yes. Um, <laughs> Google image is not going to be very helpful if I just look up pink flower, but to to put in the show notes because I can't imagine this because I don't know what the flower looks what like. What the flower so. looks like, yeah. And one other flower, since we're on flowers, that has a, the, the color comes to, you know, the color of the flower comes mm -hmm. to be used as a color term is the carnation. Right, right. So we talk about carnation color. There are a couple of suggestions as to where the word for the flower carnation comes from. I think the most accepted explanation is that it comes from coronation, from the idea that it looks right. sort of like a crown or that you might wear it on your head. Okay. But I prefer the explanation that it means literally flesh colored from Latin Oh, caro carnis, okay. right? right? Flesh. Right, yeah, yeah. So carnation, like incarnation, mm -hmm. is right, right. flesh colored. Right, yeah. And that would make sense. Then we would have a flesh colored color. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it depends whether it refers to the color of flesh in a Northern European skin color mm -hmm. or literally the color of flesh, like, you know, blood. Blood, and, yeah. And cut open meat. <laughs> right. Meat colored. Meat colored. <laughs> because, of course, the thing that should be remembered is carnations come in many colors. Many colors, yeah, not well, exactly. Just pink. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah, it doesn't yeah. necessarily need to mean, you know, what Crayola used to call flesh colored. Flesh colored, yeah. Uh, yeah. It could be a lot of different colors. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, many etymologists prefer the coronation right. explanation. Right. But I don't think we could leave the topic of pink without discussing the modern gender association of the word pink. Right. There's a bit of a, an urban myth about this mm -hmm. that pink used to be the boy's color. And blue used to be the girl's color, and they flipped right. sometime around the early, sometime in the early 20th century. This is apparently somewhat overstated, however, mm -hmm. um, and I'm basing this on just what I read in an article on, or, or there's there's a discussion of this um, mm -hmm. in Wikipedia. Okay. Um, but basically, they point someone who has written this article has pointed out that there was more of a fluidity in terms of which color could be used for a boy and pink right. or blue were, were possible okay. but it wasn't that pink they was the strong. boy's color they were strong yeah. it was it was just looser associations i guess the point here about pink that we should just say explicitly is it's not a basic color term no it and it i guess it comes is just quite a late. shade of red yes and in most languages it it's isn't differentiated red. you can just say pale red whitish red reddish white mm -hmm. if you need to say anything or refer to a an item in the world that is that color so it, it is a very late like orange and we talked about that before mm -hmm. it is something that doesn't really get differentiated very often so and again it isn't really a spectrum color no okay so that's pink that's pink out of the way so we're just left with brown and i could be even shorter with this one on ancient uses there's essentially no ancient words for brown <laughs> <laughs> i mean there are uh, but most of them i've already covered under red or yellow because they're just shades of those other colors things aren't described as brown nobody cares if anything's brown you get dark right. hair isn't brown it's dark eyes aren't brown they're dark i have nothing to say about brown <laughs> and presumably if there is any association at all with that color in the ancient world it's the same one uh, as there is in the middle ages which is that brown is just the color of lower class colors you know yes. lo lower yes. class clothing so why yeah. would you talk about it very much yeah it's dull it's yeah. just it, it's the it's the unmarked color that things are yeah clothing houses animals they're just brown unless mentioned otherwise mm -hmm. i think basically and so that is the main association in the middle ages with both brown and gray is is just it's the color of poor people right basically right. and indeed there was a, a law passed in england in 1363 that required the poor to wear only brown so Sumptuary laws, right. you know, the opposite could, of sumptuary laws, the in opposite a way. of yeah. sumptuary laws, what you were not allowed to wear, what you were allowed to wear, uh, according to your class. But of course, the cloth is also therefore worn in the church as a sign of your piety mm -hmm. and your and of penitence, penitence and, yeah, and your simplicity, uh, simplicity, giving up on on riches. Particularly, we associate so mendicant orders, yeah, various um, who uh, give away monks, all yeah. their yeah their property, um, like the Franciscans and so forth. Right. 
Hence, did you talk about cappuccinos? Cappuccinos, in yes. In the podcast, or is that only in it a video? It was in a video, I think. I don't think it's made it to, it's in the costume right. video. So the capuchin monks, that color was thought to look like coffee later on. And so that's where cappuccino comes from. It's the color of the... Of coffee with milk in it. Of coffee with milk in it is yeah. the color of, of their, this, robes. their robes. Uh, similarly, the capuchin monkey, yeah. again, similarly colored right. to the, the monks. So monks and monkeys, I guess. <laughs> but obviously the the key word in um in english in modern english is brown mm -hmm. and it comes from uh, a, a proto-indo-european root bear that means bright or brown and that may seem a little odd to us at first mm -hmm. but then we remember that everything in proto-indo-european times was bright and shiny <laughs> <laughs> or maybe nothing was and so they described they everything as being everything that way, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> yes but it that explains why from this root we also get the word burnish Right. And so brown could be used to refer to a shiny sword um, in, in some contexts. <laughs> that um, does seem unlikely, doesn't it? <laughs> but the other interesting word that we get from this same brown root is bear, the word bear and right. the word beaver, <laughs> both of which literally mean the brown animal. Right. Now, okay. that may seem like really boring naming conventions. <laughs> Given that there's a lot of brown, brown animals, animals in the world, yes. <laughs> especially uh, in Northern Europe. Like, there's a lot of brown animals. Yes. There's very the few animals that aren't, aren't brown. brown. <laughs> yes. But the hypothesis is that this is an example of taboo replacement in, in the north that happened in For the, the northern bears countries. In For the bears presumably. in particular. Yeah. yeah. I mean, beavers are not very taboo. Taboo worthy? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know, but anyway. But certainly we know that bears were revered animals in a lot of northern cultures. Mm -hmm. And dangerous. And dangerous. Yeah, yeah. yeah that combination. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in, uh, in in Germanic culture, mm -hmm. uh, the bear was a very important animal. So, for instance, think of Beowulf, right, mm -hmm. whose name, again, is one explanation is that it is a kenning for a bear. Be Be wolf. wolf. A um, way of saying bear without, without saying, saying bear. bear right. right. But he has bear-like strength. Right. Good name for a hero. And so the bear is often called Bruin. Bruin, which yeah. also comes from that root. Mm -hmm. Again, it just means brown thing. The Proto-Indo-European word, there is a Proto-Indo-European word for bear, literally, mm -hmm. in the literal sense. It's a little hard to pronounce the Proto-Indo-European. It's Urtko, R-T-K-O. Yeah. That's so. where we get Arctic. Right. Arcturus and, yeah. and Ursine. And presumably. Ursine presumably yeah. comes from that as well. And by the way, the Arctic is called the Arctic not because there are polar bears there, <laughs> uh, but because of the constellation marking out that part of the sky. Mm -hmm. Now, there are, of course, other colors, other color brown color words in modern English, like sepia, which comes from the Latin word sepia for cuttlefish, which ultimately comes from a Greek sepain, which means to make rotten. Oh. It gives us the word septic as well. Okay. Do you have any explanation for that? As to why? Well, maybe cuttlefish go rotten easily? Don't know. Probably they do, but that seems okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And that's because of the ink of the but cuttlefish. But that's because of the ink, yes. The ink taken from the cuttlefish makes that particular dark brown right. color that was used as an ink, as yeah. an ink in uh, medieval manuscripts and so forth. Speaking of brown pigments, I just had to mention my favorite brown pigment, which is mummy brown yes i knew that was what you were going to say <laughs> i just i i knew that yes well it ties us nicely back to the ancient world uh, right. mummy brown if you haven't heard uh, of this before is a pigment that was literally made from the ground up mummies, mummies mm -hmm. that they were you know discovering in i guess the 18th 19th century mm -hmm. um, as egyptology was really picking up well, and you could find, I mean, Roman mummies and, and not very exciting mummies were right. pretty easy to find, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't have to dig up long lost tombs to right. find mummies in, in ancient in Egypt. In Egypt. Egypt has yeah. been able to produce mummies for a long time. I mean, they're, they're in alchemist yes. recipes and yeah. stuff like that. So, so mummified remains, mummified remains were not that hard to find. And yeah, they were a big trade. It was really popular color. You grind up the mummy and you turn it into a pigment and it was very popular. Uh, for artists. Like for was, artists. Yeah, yeah, not a dye. It was a, it was a pigment. Pigment painting. for, for yeah. painting. Yeah. And it was sold until, until the 20th century, yeah, I, I think. think so. Yeah. At which point somebody somewhere went, you can't These destroy are people. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. It, well, also that I suppose. Yeah, yeah you can't. You can't have <laughs> the, human the, remains on your. Look at canvas. our two. Look at our two uh, complimentary responses. You're thinking you can't destroy like, archaeological remains, <laughs> and I'm thinking these are people you're painting on your canvases. <laughs> 
both valid I wonder which responses. Which was the reason? <laughs> I suspect it was the people you think? part. Maybe. I think, um, but I don't know. Just because a lot of mummies aren't terribly archaeologically valuable necessarily. True. But they may not all be uh, mummified people. They could have been mummified animals. That's true. Certainly a lot of those. So. That's true. So either way, not a thing it anymore. It also may have just become too expensive. <laughs> right. Is the other thing. As the source became a this little is, more yeah. controlled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mummy brown is not a thing anymore. No, it is not. Though, do they still call a shade of brown yeah. mummy brown? That in, I in don't your know. Pack of Crayola crayons? I don't know. Not in Crayola, but there might be in, in, <laughs> in art. Paint, paint. In paint supplies. Yeah. I don't know. Paint supplies. If you're an artist and you've ever come across mummy brown, let us know. So that completes our discussion of brown and therefore our discussion, our discussion of, colors. of colors. But yes, I think that wraps up our colors. If there's any particular question or topic or color word that we haven't covered that you'd like us to talk about and do a little research on. If you really want us to do gray. <laughs> or anything else. If there's a particular connotation that you think is interesting, we'd love to hear from you. You know, tweet us or leave a comment on the website or get in touch on Facebook, whatever. Because it would be interesting to know if there are other directions we could go with mm -hmm. these color words. I mean, I continue to love color mm -hmm. and, and the discussion of it. But I think for now, we're probably going to put it to bed for a while mm -hmm. and move on to other types of uh, terminology. Also, if you have any comments about other associations of, of the colors that we've talked about today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. purple, pink, and brown, we haven't discussed a lot of the modern associations other than the pink, blue, gender. Yeah, uh, yeah no, but there's... I know there are some really interesting stuff about modern associations about purple. So uh, if you uh, wish to comment about that, we'd love to hear it as well. Mm -hmm, for sure. So get in touch and uh, give us some feedback. That'd be great. But for now, I finished my cocktail. So what more is there to do? <laughs> exactly. We'll be back soon with more conversation about something else. <laughs> For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. We're recording a podcast. Hello. Okay. <laughs> okay, bye. Go, go. Go and close the door after you, please.